Ashley Brock, the Nora Roberts book, Sea Swept. <sighs> Chapter 19. Cam's first reaction was pure annoyance. Something was happening here. Something monumental, and he didn't want any interruptions. We're not open for business, Mackenzie. He kept his grip on Anna's arms firm and turned his back to the man. He considered no more than a paper-pushing pest. Didn't think you were. His voice still mild and friendly. Mackenzie wandered in. In his line of work, he rarely received a warm welcome. Door was unlocked. Well, this is going to be quite a space. He was Harry, homemaker at heart, in the sight of all those spunking new flower toys stored the juices. Got yourself some top-grade equipment here. You want a boat? Come back tomorrow and we'll talk. I get seasick, Mackenzie confessed with a quick grimace. Can't even stand on the dock without getting queasy. That stuff go away. But I sure do admire the look of boats. Can't say I ever gave much thought of what went into building them. That's some brand new saw over there. Must set you back some. <sighs> this, time t this time came to hit turn. Fearing his eyes as dangerous as a cock gun. It's my business. I'll spend my money. Baffled by the exchange, Anna laid a hand on Chan Cam's arm. She wasn't surprised that he was being rude. She'd seen him be rude before, but the snap of hiss of his anger over what appeared to be no more than a nuisance puzzled her. This is the way he tends to treat potential clients. She thought he might as well close the doors now. Before she could think of the proper calming words, Cam shook her off. What the hell do you want now? Just a couple questions, he nodded pointly at Anna. Ma'am. Larry McKenzie, claim investigator for a true life of the insurance. In the dark, Anna automatically accepted the hand he held out. Mr. McKenzie, I'm Anna Spinelli. McKenzie did a quick flip through his mental file. It took only a moment for him to tag her as set the Lockner's case with her as he had come on the scene after the death of the insurance. He had no need to contact her, but she was in his records. In the cozy little scene, he walked in on and told him she was pretty tight with the less, at least one of the Quins. He wasn't sure if it if or how that little bit of information would apply, but he would just make a no note of it. Pleased to meet you. If you two have business to discuss, and we can, I'll just... Pleased to meet you. If you two have business to discuss, and we can, I'll just wait outside. I don't have anything to discuss with him. Now or later. Go file your report, Mackenzie. We're done. Just about. I figured you'd like to know. I'll be heading back to the home office. Got a lot of mixed results on my interviews, Mr. Quinn. Not much of what you called hard facts, though. Glanced toward the man saw again. Wished fleetingly he could afford one like it. There's a letter that was found in your father's car. That goes to the state of mind. Single car accident driver. A physical fit man. No traces of alcohol or drugs. There's a shoulder. Then there's the fact that the insurance increased his policy. That had been officially short before the accident. The company looks hard on that kind of thing. You go ahead and look. Cam's voice is loud. Like the warning growl on a tackle. But not here. Not my place. Just letting you know how things stand. Starting a new business, McKinney said controversially. Takes a good chunk of capital. You've been planning this for long? Camps ran quickly. Had McKenzie by the labels and up on the toes of his shiny lace up shoes. You son of a bitch. Cam, stop it. The order was quick and sharp, and Anna punctuated it by stepping forward and shoving a hand on each man's chest. She thought it was like moving between a wolf and a bull, but she held around. Mr. McKenzie, I think you better go now. On my way. His voice was steady enough, despite the cold sweat that had pulled at the base of his neck. And it was even now dripping down his mind. It's just details, Miss Quinn. The company pays me to gather the details. But it didn't pay him. He reminded himself as he walked outside where he could go up in there. Be beaten up pulled by a furious beneficiary. Bastard. Fucking bastard. Ken desperately wanted to hit something. Anything, but there was too much empty air. Does he really think my father plowed on the telephone pole so we could start building boats? I should have decked him. God damn it. First they say he did it because he couldn't face the scandal. Now it's because he wanted us to have a pile of money. The hell was their dead money. They didn't know him. They don't know any of us. They don't let him rant. Let him prowl around the building. Look for something to damage. Her heart was frozen in her chest. Suicide was suspected. She thought normally investigation was in place. Kevin known. Must have known all along. That was a claim investigator from the company who holds your father's life insurance policy. That was a fucking moron. Can't world. Moros. Sting in his tongue. And he saw her face. Something entirely too cool. It's nothing. It's a hassle. Let's get out of here. It's suspected that your father committed suicide? He didn't kill himself. She held up a hand. She had to keep her buried for now. And leave was practical. 
You've spoken with Mackenzie before, and I assume you, your lawyer, at any rate, has been in contact with the insurance company about this matter for some time. Phillips handling it. You know, you knew, but he didn't tell me. It has nothing to do with you. No, she realized it wasn't possible to keep all her heart buried. I see. That was personal. She reminded herself. She would deal with that later. And as to how it affects Seth? Barry sprang up again. Carl said, he doesn't know anything about it. If you actually believe that, you're deluding yourself. Gossip runs six in small towns, close communities, and young boys hear a great deal. It was the caseworker now. Cam thought was rising resentment. She might as well be carrying a briefcase and wearing one of her dumpy suits. Gossip's all it is. It doesn't matter. On the contrary, gossip can be very damaging. You'd be wiser to be open with him, to be honest. Though that seems to be difficult for you. Don't twist this around on me, Anna. It's goddamn insurance. It's nothing. It's your father, she cracked. His reputation. I don't imagine there's much that meant more to you. Uh, there's not much that means more to you. She drew in a deep breath. But as you said, it's nothing to do with me on a personal level. I think we're finished here. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Step in front of her, blocking her exit. Yet the sneaky feeling that if she walked out, she meant to walk a lot farther than this car. Why? So you can explain? It's family business. I'm not family. You're absolutely right. It amazed her that her voice was so calm, so detached, so utterly reasonable when she's bullying us out. And imagine you felt it best to hold the matter back from Seth's caseworker. Much my wiser much wiser to show her only the positive angles. Lock up any negatives. My father didn't kill himself. I don't have to defend him to you or anyone. No, you don't. And I've never asked you to. Except around him and started for the door. He caught her before she reached it. But she expected but she expected that in turn calmly. There's no point in arguing, Cam. We essentially, when essentially we agree. There's, there's no point in you being pissed off, each other. We're handling the insurance company. We're handling the gossip about Seth being his love child. For Christ's sake! What? Stunned, she pressed hand her head. There's speculation that Seth is your father's illegitimate son. It's nothing but bull with small minds. Cam replied. My God. Have you considered even for a moment what it could do to Seth to hear that kid, that kind of talk? Have you considered even for a moment that this was something I needed to know in order to evaluate, in order to help Seth properly? Someone into his pockets. His thumbs went into his pocket. Yeah, I considered it, and I didn't tell you, because we're handling it. We're talking about my father here. We're also talking about a minor child in your care. He is in my care. And that's the point. I'm doing what I thought was best all around. I didn't tell you about the insurance thing or about the gossip because they're both lies. Perhaps they are, but not telling me. You lie. I wasn't going to go around feeling about feeling anybody. I wasn't going to go around feeling anybody this crap that the kid was my father's bastard. She nodded slowly. Well, take it from some other man's bastard. Doesn't make sense. Less of a person. I didn't mean it like that. We ain't reached out for her, but she said, Don't do that. Exploded with it. Whatever wrong. Don't back off from me. For Christ's sake, Anna. My life has turned inside out in the past couple of months, and I don't know how long it's going to be before I can turn it back around. I've got the kid to worry about. The business. You. McKin Mackenzie's coming around. People are speculating about my father's morals over the fresh fruit at the supermarket. Says bitch of a mother's down in Norfolk. Wait! She didn't move away this time. She says mother has contacted you. No, no. Jesus, his brain was on fire. We hired a detective to track her down. Phil figured we'd be better off knowing where she is, what she's up to. I see. There are broken two halves, one for the woman, one for the professional. Both sides bled. And she's in Norfolk. Well, you didn't bother to tell me that either. No, I didn't tell you. He backed himself into this corner. Kim realized and there was no way out of it. We only know she was there a couple of days ago. Social services would expect to be notified on this information. Kept his eyes on her nose. I guess they just were. My mistake. That was a line between them now. She realized very sick and very darkly drunk. Obviously, you don't think very much of me, or of yourself, for that matter. Let me explain something to you. 
However, I may be feeling about you on a personal level at this moment. It's my professional opinion that you and your brothers are the right guardians for set. Okay, so, so, I will have to take this information I've just learned into consideration. She continued. I will have to, be, it will have to be documented. All that's going to do is screw things up for the kid. He hated the fact that his stomach clenched at the thought. He hated the idea that he might see that look of white face to fear on Seth's face. I'm not going to let some sick gossip mess things up for him. Well, on that, we can't agree. She's gotten her wish on one level and realized she'd been around to see how much Seth would come to matter to him just long enough, she thought hardly. It's my professional opinion that Seth is well cared for, both physically and emotionally. Her voice was brisk now, professional. He's happy and is beginning to feel secure. Added to that is the fact that he loves you, and you love him. Though neither of one of you may fully realize it, I still believe counseling would benefit all of you, and that, too, will go into my report and recommendations when the court rules on permanent guardianship. As I told you from the beginning, my concern, my primary concern, is the best welfare of the child. She was solemnly behind them. Cam realized and would have been, no matter what he told her, or that told her, guilt struck at him a sharp backward blow. I was never less than honest with you, she said before he went, damn it, Anna. I'm not through, sickle. I have no doubt that you'll see Seth is well settled, that this new business is secure before, as you put it, turn your life back around, which I assume means picking up your racing career in Europe. You'll have to find a way to juggle your needs, but that's not my concern. For there may become a time when the guardianship is contested, if indeed Seth's mother makes her way back here. At that time, the case file will be reevaluated. If he remains happy and well cared for under your guardianship, I'll do whatever I can to see it that he remains with you. I'm on his side, which appears to put me on yours. That's all. Shame layered on, shame layered on guilt with a sprinkle of relief between Anna. I know how much you've done. I'm grateful. She shook her head when he lifted hand. I'm not feeling very friendly towards you at the moment. I don't want to be touched. Fine. I won't touch you. Let's find somewhere to sit down and talk the rest of this out. I thought we just had. Now you're being stubborn. No. Now I'm being realistic. You slept with me, but you didn't trust me. The fact that I was honest with you, and you weren't with me, is my problem. The fact that I went to bed with a man, saw me as an enjoyment on one hand, and an obstacle on the other, is my mistake. That's not the way it was. His temper began to rise again, pumped by a slick pen. That's not the way it is. It's the way I see it. Now I need to take some time and see how I feel about that. I appreciate if you drive me back to my car. She turned and walked away. He preferred fire to ice, but he couldn't break through the frigid, frigid shield she wrapped around her temper. It scared him. A sensation that he didn't appreciate. She was perfectly polite, even friendly. Set in Philip when she returned to the house to gather her things. She was perfectly polite to Cam. So the plight that he imagined he would feel the chill of it for days. He told himself it didn't matter. She'd get over it. She was just a snip because he hadn't bared his soul. Shared all the intimate details of his life with her. It was a woman thing. After all, women had invented the cold shoulder just to make men feel like slugs. He would give her a couple days. He decided. Let her stew. Let her come to her senses. Then he would take her flowers. She's ticked off at you, said Common as came stood by the front door, staring out. What do you know? She's ticked off. Seth repeated entertaining himself with a sketchbook while sitting cross legged on the front porch. She didn't let you kiss her goodbye. And here all the time locking lips. Shut up. What you do? I didn't do anything. Cam kicked the door open, stomped out. She's just being female. He did something, says I to Mousley. She's not a jerk. She'll get over it. Cam dropped down on the rocker. He wasn't going to worry about it. He never worried about women. He lost his appetite. How was he supposed to eat fried fish without remembering how he and Anna had sat on the dock that morning? He couldn't sleep. How was he supposed to sleep in his own bed without remembering how they made love on those same sheets? Couldn't concentrate on work. How was he supposed to detail diagonals without remembering how she beamed at him when he showed her the lofty platform? <laughs> By mid morning, he gave up and drove to Princess Annie, but he didn't take flowers. No, he was ticked off. He stood through the reception area, straight back and into her office. The fume, when he found it empty, typical, was all he could think. His look had turned all bad. Mr. Quinn? Milo stood in the doorway, her hands folded. Is there something I can do for you? I'm looking for Anna. Miss Spinelli. I'm sorry, she's not available. I'll wait. 
It'll be a long one. She won't be in until next week. Next week? <laughs> Isn't there a wife? Right, I'm a little steel sharpening the killing point. What do you mean she won't be in? Miss Spinelli is taking the week off. And Molly figured the reason for it was even now born whole, sir, with furious gray eyes. <laughs> She thought the same when Anna had dropped off a report that morning requesting time. I'm familiar with the case file. There's something I can do. No, it's personal. Where did she go? I can't give you that information, Mr. Quinn, but you're free to leave a message. Either written one or one of her on a voicemail. Of course, if she checks in, I'll be happy to tell her you'd like to speak with her. Yeah, thanks. He couldn't get out fast enough. She was probably in her apartment. He decided as he hopped back in his car, soaking. So he would let her yell at him. Get it all out of the system. Then he nudged her along the bed so they could put this ridiculous little episode behind them, ignoring the nerves dancing in stomach. So he walked down the hall to her apartments. He knocked briskly, then tucked his hands into his pockets. He knocked louder, banged his fist on the door. Damn it, Anna, open up. This is stupid. I saw your car out front. The door behind him creaked open. One of the sisters peered out. The jingling sound of a morning game show filled the air. She's not in there, Anna's young man. Her car's out front, he said. She took a cab. He bit back an oath. Yes! On a charming smile and walked across her. Where to? To the train station, or maybe it was the airport. She screamed up at him. Really, he was such a handsome boy. She said she'd be gone for a few days. She'd promised to call to make sure her sister and I were getting on. Such a sweet girl, thinking of us when she's on vacation. Vacation, too. Did she say? The woman bit her lip, her eyes unfocused and talked. I don't think she mentioned it. She was in an awful hurry, but she stopped by just the same, so we wouldn't be worried. She's such a considering girl. Yeah, sweet considering girl left in my dry. She had no business flying to Pittsburgh. The airfare had eaten a large hole in her budget, but she wanted to get there. Had needed to get there the minute she walked into her grandparents' Grant Row house, half her burden lived in. In a... Anna Lois. Theresa Spinelli was a tiny, slim woman with still gray hair, ruthlessly waved, a face that fell into dozens of comfortable wrinkles, and a smile as wide as the Mediterranean Sea. Anna had to bend low to be clasped and kissed. Ow, 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 but be no home. It's good to be home, Nana. Alberto Spinelli hurried to the door. He was a foot taller than his wife, tiny. Wife's tidy, 5'3", with a broad chest and a spare tie that pressed cozily against Anna as they embraced. His hair was thin and white, his eyes dark and merry, behind his thick glasses. He all but carried her into the living room, where they could begin to fuss over her in earnest. They spoke rapidly, and in a mix of Italian and English, food was the first order of business. Teresa always thought her baby was starving, after they piled her with minestrone, fresh bread, and an enormous cube of tormenzo. Teresa was almost satisfied that her chick wouldn't perish or be of maltation. Now, I'll sit back down. Pop in the life of one of his sick cars. You tell us why are you here. Do I need a reason to come home? Struggling to feel relaxed fully, Anna stretched out in one of, of a pair of ancient wing chairs. It had been recovered, she knew, countless times. Just now it was a gay striped pattern, but the cushion was still gave way beneath her butt like butter. You called three days ago. You didn't say you were coming home. It was an impulse. I've been swamped at work up to my ears. I'm tired and want to break. I wanted to come home and eat Nana's cooking for a while. It was true enough, if not the whole truth. She didn't think it would be wise to tell her doting grandparents that she walked into an affair, eyes wide open, and ended up with her heart broken. You work too hard, Teresa said. Oh, don't I tell you the girl works too hard. She likes to work hard. She likes to use her brain. It's a good brain. Me? I've got a good brain, too. And I say she's not here just to eat your pet macaroni. Macaroni. And we have a matrimony for dinner, and a beam knowing it wouldn't distract them. For long, they'd seen her through the worst, stuck by her when she'd done her best to hurt them and herself when they knew it. I started the sauce the minute you called to say you were coming. Al, don't nag the girl. I'm not nagging, I'm asking. Three roll rise. You have such a good brain in that big head of yours. You know it's a boy that sent her running home. Is he Italian? Theresa demanded, fixing Anna with those bright bird eyes to the left. God, it was good to be home. I have no idea, but he loves my red sauce. And he's got good taste. Why don't you bring him home let us get a look at him? Because we're having some problems, and I need to work them out. Work them out, Theresa whispered. How do you work them out when you're here and he's not? Is he good looking? Gorgeous. 
Does he have work? I want to know. He's starting his own business with his brothers. Good, he knows family. Therese. Good, he knows family. Therese nodded, please. You bring him next time. We'll see for ourselves. All right. She said because it was easier to agree than to explain. I'm going to unpack. He's hurt. He's hurt her heart, Therese murmured when Anna left the room. I already showed him pat her hand. It's a strong heart. Anna took her time, hanging her clothes in the closet, folding them into the drawers of the old dresser she used as a child. The room was so much the same. The wallpaper had faded a bit. She remembered that her grandfather had hugged it himself. Hung it himself to wreck the room when she come to live with them. She hated the pretty roses on the wall because they looked so fresh and alive and everything inside her was dead. The roses were still there, a little older but still there. As were her grandparents, she sat on the bed hearing the familiar creak of springs, the familiar, the company, and the secure. That, she admitted, was what she wanted. Home, children, routine, the surprises that family always provided thrown in. To some, she supposed it would have sounded ordinary. At one time, she had told herself that same thing. But she knew better now. Home, marriage, family. There's nothing ordinary there. Three elements formed a unit that was unique and precious. She wanted, needed that, for herself. Maybe she had been playing games after all. Maybe she hadn't been completely honest. Not with Cam, not with herself. She hadn't tried to trap him into her dreams. But underneath it all, had she began to hope he'd share them? She maintained a front of casual, no string sex, but her heart had been reckless enough to yearn for more. Maybe she deserved to have it broken. The hell she did, she thought, springing up. She'd been making it enough. She accepted the limitations of the relationship, but still he had trusted her that she won't tolerate. Damned if she'd take the blame for this, she decided to stalk to the steered strict mirror over her dresser. She began to freshen her makeup. She would she would have want she wanted one day. A strong man who loved her, respected her, and trusted her. She would have a man who saw her as a partner, not as an enemy. She'd have the home in the country near the water, children of her own, a goddamn stupid dog if she wanted. She would have it all. It just wouldn't be. It was Cameron Quinn. If anything, she should thank him for opening her eyes, not only to the law flaws in their so-called relationship, but their own needs and desires. She would rather choke. End of chapter 19